Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Coordinated Assistance to States, also known as CCAS. This is a webinar on reducing isolation in youth facilities, strategies for working with your most challenging youth. My name is Mike Dempsey, and I'm the Executive Director for the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, also known as CJCA. Joining me in leading today's call is Sharon Pett, who serves as the Project Manager for the Reducing Isolation in Youth Facilities Initiative. Sharon has been working and providing training and technical assistance to a total of 14 jurisdictions throughout the nation on their efforts to implement alternative strategies to isolation. Also with us and helping to produce this webinar is Brendan Donahue, who is the Technology Manager for the Performance-Based Standards Learning Institute. Without Brendan, this webinar certainly would not be possible, so we want to thank him for taking the time to work with us on this project. As you can see by the next slide, it's important for everyone to know that the Reducing Isolation Initiative is made possible through a partnership with the Center for Coordinated Assistance to States. CCAS was developed in 2014 with a grant from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Pre Prevention. The purpose of the center is to assess the need for and coordinate the training and technical assistance designed to build capacity within states, territories, tribal units, and communities to maximize the effectiveness of juvenile justice systems to benefit the youth they serve. The focus of the center is to provide ongoing coaching and achieve individual and or behavioral changes that positively impact the juvenile justice system and more importantly, the youth in your care. Joining OJJDP as partners on this project is the American Institute of Research in Washington, D.C., as well as the Center for Juvenile Justice Reform at Georgetown University. I want to thank you for your contributions and continued partnership with CJCA. I also want to quickly thank all the PBS sites who are joining today's webinar. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Brendan, who's going to discuss the, the housekeeping for the technical issues. Thanks, Mike. And, and just a couple quick things here before we get started. Uh, just try to answer some of the questions that I know we get on each one of these webinars. But today on the webinar, there's two options for your audio. You can listen through your computer, or you can also dial in on the telephone. Uh, but the key here is to not try and do both, because that's how you can end up with an echo or some some unwanted feedback on your line. So if you're having trouble with the audio, make sure you go to the audio portion on your computer screen and choose the appropriate audio option, either computer audio or telephone. And if you're doing the telephone, make sure you choose that option on the screen first and make sure you enter your PIN number. If you skipped that on the way in today, you can press pound, enter the PIN number again and hit pound and that should register your line. That really helps cut down on the echo uh, and some of the feedback that you might have on your line. Uh, we've got over 130 people already in attendance today and more expected. So because of the volume of people we have, everybody is going to be muted. But we'll take questions anytime. You can type them in throughout the course of the presentation. We'll make sure there's plenty of Q&A at the end of the, uh, after each presenter has a chance to present their slides today. So type in those questions at any point. Try to let us know who you're directing your question towards so that we can uh, make sure we direct it towards the right person. If it's referencing something specific in the slides, just make sure you mention that in your question. Uh, but we'll make sure we read those. And uh, the question that we always get, and we had it within 60 seconds of starting today's presentation, is where's the PowerPoint for today? And don't worry, we'll do follow-up emails. We usually send out the follow-up emails within about 24 to 48 hours of the, the webinar end. So you should see something by either uh, Wednesday or Thursday that has a copy of the slides. We'll record today's webinar, so there'll be a video available that you can watch and you can share with your staff in case they missed it here today. Uh, but all that will be sent through follow-up emails. So, yep, you'll get a copy of the PowerPoint slides. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Mike and tell us who we've got on here. All right, thank you, Brendan. Uh, I'd like to begin by introducing the presenters for today's program. We are very fortunate to have four panelists today who work within three different state juvenile justice agencies. First, we have Peter Forbes, who is Commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services. Then we'll have Natalie Walker, Assistant Director, Indiana Division of Youth Services. Mark Canola, Program Director for the Indiana Division of Youth Services. And Nick Sotelo, Youth Development Coordinator, Facility Services, Oregon Youth Authority. So with that, Sharon, I'm going to turn it over to you to go through the objectives. 
Great. Good afternoon, everyone. As Mike mentioned, I'm Sharon Petz, and I've been the project manager for the Reducing Isolation Initiative for the past three years. I'm really excited to have all of our wonderful presenters here with us today to talk with us about effective ways of working with these most challenging youth in our system. So more specifically, I want to, you'll see the objectives on the screen here. And so what we hope to accomplish today on today's webinar is the first objective is to better understand strategies for working with youth who have chronic or significant mental health issues, primary or secondary trauma, or, and or repeated highly assaultive or aggressive behaviors. So secondly, we hope that participants will learn how three state juvenile justice agencies, that's Indiana, Massachusetts, and Oregon, have effectively programmed for these most challenging youth. And lastly, we hope that participants will be able to take the information they learn from today's webinar and apply it to their daily interactions with youth in their facilities. So in the field of juvenile justice, we have all encountered a wide wide variety of youth who present with very unique issues and who could easily be classified as challenging. However, I'm sure that we can all agree that these three groups listed on the screen here tend to be the highest, um, the, the, uh, in the higher echelon in terms of youth who require additional staff time, attention, and support. And so the focus of today's webinar will be on sharing strategies dealing um, with those youth in our facility who, who are challenged in these three areas that you see listed on the screen. And so we have a lot of material to cover today, so I don't want to spend too long on this, but I do feel it's important to review some of the research in the field specific to each of these three populations that we'll be hearing about. So our first subpopulation are those youth who suffer significant and or chronic mental health issues. Some certain in our professional experience, it's no secret that there has been a drastic increase in the number of youth exhibiting serious mental health issues showing up in our juvenile justice system. In, our, in terms of research, the professional body of literature verifies this. So in a meta, one particular meta-analysis published by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, they found that anywhere from 63 to 92% of youth met the formal criteria for mental health or substance use disorder. This percentage is astounding. So they also found that the issue of mental health disorders um, is exacerbated by the fact that most people suffer not just from one disorder, but from two or more serious mental health disorders. So this obviously makes our work with these young people much more complex. It's a sort of a, an enigma or a puzzle that we need to figure out in order to best serve these youth, because this is our job if our ultimate goal is to help youth become positive members of society. And so here's a list of the most common mental health diagnoses that we're seeing in juvenile justice facilities. These likely, again, come as no surprise to all of you folks. Uh, we see ADHD, PTSD, conduct disorder, major depression, and so on. So as a reminder, youth are not only battling one of these disorders, but are often struggling with two or more simultaneously. So the second subpopulation that we're going to be talking about today are youth who have experienced simple or complex trauma in their lives. So the research is really clear that, that trauma is a pervasive issue in our juvenile justice facilities. In a study mentioned here, researchers found that 93% of youth in custody had at least one traumatic incident, and over half of the youth population had experienced trauma six or more times. Again, this le level of trauma to me is unfathomable, and hopefully to most of you as well. Um, and with this knowledge, it's easier for us to understand many of the negative behaviors that we witness in our our facilities on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in many ways, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a formula. Um, Over-traumatized youth plus a lack of coping skills equals negative acting out behaviors. So throughout today's webinar, presenters are really going to help us better understand trauma and, and its impacts. So what the research also tells us is that in addition to trauma impacting a youth's ability to regulate their emotions, it also puts them at greater risk for developing, uh, developing depression, PTSD, and suicidal ideation. And so these youth are also at increased risk for engaging in delinquent behavior, running away, struggling academically, and abusing alcohol and drugs. And so the third population we want to um, discuss today are those youth who present as highly aggressive and or exhibit highly assaultive behaviors. So this excerpt was selected from the Desktop Guide to Quality Practice for Working with Using Confinement, which was published by OJDDP and some of their partners. You can all go ahead and read this, um, but essentially what this excerpt uh, calls upon us to do as professionals is 
to recognize the skill deficits in these youth and cater our treatment to addressing these deficiencies. So rather than, rather than adhering to the traditional approach of punishment. So, and we're gonna be hearing from our presenters today about some of the specific strategies that they employ to um, help with this population. And so when working with um, this particular subgroup, those you know, youth that are highly aggressive or assaultive, the question to ask ourselves is not what do we do with a youth who is seriously aggressive but rather what have we done or not done before now that allowed the youth behavior to escalate to this point point? and so again it's our responsibility as professionals to employ effective strategies to dealing with this these challenging youth and so again i just wanted to share this you can go ahead and, and uh, read this um, but basically, I wanted to share this because I think it's a good reminder that by the very nature of these youth, there's a lot of work to be done with all three of these subpopulations. These are our most challenging youth. And so this excerpt reminds us that behavior management is not a one-time response, but rather um, in order to really affect positive behavior change, we must create a culture that views these youth through a therapeutic lens. And so again, it's our responsibility to address the deficits of these young people by building skills, assisting them in identifying triggers, providing them tools to regulate their emotions, and of course, teaching them how to identify and transform their faulty thinking. And so here's the million dollar question and the fundamental question for today's webinar. How can we best serve these special youth populations and avoid using isolation while also ensuring that staff continue to feel supportive? So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hand the floor over now to our first two panelists from the Indiana Division of Youth Services, Natalie Walker and Mark Canola, so they can share their wisdom with us. Natalie and Mark, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, good afternoon, everyone. In Indiana, we've implemented a series of initiatives to respond to youth behavior and challenges, including staff training, multidisciplinary meetings, individualized behavior plans, as well as housing units and incentive programs. So what we're gonna talk about first is staff training. After completing a pre-service academy, juvenile staff have an, one additional week of training to focus on juvenile specific topics. It is called the Making a Change or MAC Academy. Listed on this slide are a few of the training topics covered during the MAC Academy. The training is instructor led with classroom discussions and activities. During the MAC Academy, we discuss adolescent development and break them into each stage of physical, cognitive, emotional, and social changes. Prior to the MAC Academy, staff are provided with information about mental health issues, various disorders, description of typical behavior, et cetera. MAC Academy builds on that information and focuses on the juvenile aspect. We're gonna provide an overview of a few of the modules staff complete during the MAC Academy. One session of the MAC Academy is effective interactions with youth, especially those with mental health needs. To build on staff knowledge of mental health needs, we discuss how staff can apply that information into the work setting. It is great to have a background knowledge, but people need to know how to communicate and interact with youth. The staff are provided with techniques that assist in the communication with all students, but especially students with mental health needs. In this training module, the focus is empathetic listening, and de-escalation techniques. Staff are coached on the do's and don'ts, such as being aware of their tone of voice, making one request at a time, acknowledging the other person's feelings, and making sure they do not sound patronizing or sarcastic. During supervising high-risk students, another training topic provided during the MAC Academy, the focus of the session is on interactions while supervising high-risk students which then opens the discussion of an attitude of control versus a controlling attitude. The latter, a controlling attitude, is about punishment and others feeling bullied. We all know that that does not work with our youth population. The attitude of control is about the youth feeling the staff are in control of the environment through consistency and fairness of rule enforcement. There is discipline and accountability with an attitude of control, but discipline is different than punishment. With discipline, there's communication regarding the incident or behavior. With an attitude of control, the goal is to help the youth understand why the behavior is unacceptable, impose a logical consequence, and teach the new youth new and acceptable behavior. During trauma-informed care, participants learn about the types of trauma, impact of trauma such as emotional, physiological, psychological, social. 
recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma and ways to respond without re-traumatizing. Staff are advised they are not treating the trauma. They treat the individual who has special needs due to trauma history in a sensitive, caring, and welcoming manner. The module regarding your responsibility in making a change discuss the youth's expectations of staff and also the expectations the department has of its staff, which are similar to the, those youth's expectations. The expectations are for staff to be in control, professional, and caring. We talk about being aware of the students and their behavior, any changes in the positive or negative, and addressing or reporting the behavior. The different ways of youth accountability are shared with the staff, such as the code of conduct and token economy. Another topic in this module is staff's responsibility regarding mentoring and coaching, so assisting you to make better choices and guide them towards successful reentry back into the community. The Crisis Awareness Response Effort, or CARE team, which we've talked about during previous webinars, is described to the new employees. The CARE team is another way to display professionalism and role model conflict resolution skills to the youth. The MAC Academy ends with a scenario-based coaching. The new staff are given common occurring scenarios to role play. The situations vary from non-compliant behavior, um, self-mutilation, discipline, and de-escalation. An example of a scenario is a youth that is not compliant with the request to line up for movement to school. There are two staff role playing in the scenario. One plays the role of the staff, while the other plays the role of the students. The individual role playing the role of the staff acts how they would approach the situation in real life. After the role play, they receive feedback and constructive criticism from the other staff and the instructor. During the role play debrief, staff are challenged to think about the skills they've learned over their weeks of training, such as motivational interviewing, calming the storm, trauma-informed care, and how they can apply them to the scenario. And as we all know, over time, there's drift from training received. In order to combat drift and remind staff of the information they've learned at the beginning of their careers, all of our staff complete an annual in-service. During the annual in-service, they are provided with refresher training regarding the topics presented in MAC, such as mental health, de-escalation techniques, et cetera. Now Mark will discuss multiple disciplinary meetings in our, that occur in our facility. So another, as Natalie said, another solution that we've been looking at is, and we have been using, are multidisciplinary team meetings. These occur at least weekly, and they involve staff from all of our departments. So at these meetings, we make sure we include education staff, administrators, mental health staff, uh, treatment, or correctional counselors, as well as, and especially custody staff, we, we ask to come to these meetings. And this is a very proactive type of meeting. What we try to do is review the week together as a group, uh, process what's been going on with students, uh, certain students who, whose names come up often, or just students in general. We also take a look at the facility as a whole. Is there anything that we've noticed as a group that's going on in the facility right now? Um, when it's appropriate, we include families whenever we can via phone or in person for these meetings. And it, the, the meetings take on a formal process. We try to uh, make sure that we review the students on medication. So mental health staff will uh, review if there's been any positive or negative changes in the youth as observed by the people who see them the most often. And that's our education, treatment, and custody staff. At the same time, these departments are given a chance to review difficult cases for referrals with the mental health staff. So at first, uh, the mental health staff will talk about what types of individualized solutions have the staff tried with the students' behaviors um, and help them choose positive alternatives or give suggestions. And that way, mental health staff can triage if it's okay to continue these solutions that its staff have come up with or if it is time to refer the student for mental health services. For each student, then, we create a student information sheet, and this is initially created by treatment staff to give advice to custody staff about behaviors a youth may exhibit. So out of these meetings, we, we create this initial student information sheet. And mental health staff and the treatment staff talk about uh, what works for the student, what concerns the students might have, what behaviors staff may observe. We might also include information on the use committing offense, if it's something we think they're gonna be talking about or concerned about. We include their current treatment level and treatment progress, what groups they're in or what groups they've been referred to, um, their current medications, their individual education needs or different approaches you should take with a student, and also their projected release date. 
So these sheets kind of act as a quick guide um, for custody to get to know the students and know what's going on with the students. These, of course, are kept uh, out of the student's view. These are kept where, where custody can only look at them. After the weekly meeting, the staff update these sheets every single time the, the group meets. And so this way we can add any kind of emerging behavior concerns for students. We can also talk about new solutions that we've come up with for the behaviors or advice that we're giving. And in this way, we don't get too detailed about any root causes of any behavior. We're really trying to help custody focus on um, what they're gonna be seeing behavior-wise in students, not necessarily knowing the cause, but have a sense of ways that they could work with that individual student and also importantly notes on what does not work. So for example, we're going back to talking with students with trauma, there may be a student who you, know, you might put a hand on or move to somewhere if they're, if they're having trouble getting the line moving. There are gonna be students you can't touch like that. They're gonna take that in a different way. And we wanna make sure that anything that would put a student in crisis, custody staff are aware of so they can work around that and use alternative ways. Some students might want a timeout. Some students, a timeout is the worst thing you can give them. So we try to give them with guidance on, on how to deal with each student. Um, we've also encouraged facilities to use these meetings to refer students to mental health programs, such as dialectical behavior therapy. And in this way, treatment staff can work with mental health staff to tie what students are learning in group to their case plans. And this also helps youth practice their skills in the facility. So with custody staff at the meetings and learning about the skills, they can help the youth implement those, uh, those new skills that, that we would like them to try out and use. And then also everybody's there discussing students' reentry plans so that we can be working on how best to carry these skills over into a student's home life, school life, and life in the community. And then finally, this meeting allows staff time to reflect, identify any patterns of concern, and how to address possible issues before they rise to the level of an incident. So we want this meeting to also take a look at what's going on, see if there's anything underlying, uh, and be very proactive about addressing issues before they become in an incident. Um, so we may be looking at, you know, maybe we've noticed an increase in uh, incidents happening during free rec, free recreation. So we may want to try to problem solve. Maybe we need to add more staff to certain hours or, or take a look at what staff are on different shifts. Um, is there, do we need to maybe have more presence, have treatment staff kind of hang out down there? So just looking for these patterns um, that we have. And this way, custody is also there as part of the solution, offering suggestions, rather than admin just handing them solutions. Another uh, initiative that we've done is we've created a, a series of behavior plans for students. So, you know, we were just discussing the student information sheet. That's one of our plans that we use that we, so we can report out. Um, we get input from the youth and from the staff of all departments to create these behavior plans. We also contact the youth's family to get their input on how we can help the child. So we implemented a new intake assessment sheet for families where we not only talk about students' needs, but we also talk about students' strengths and when they're doing well and what the parents' main concerns are. What would they like to see their student do while they're in the facility? So even though you know, this, the family is not happy about this, the incarceration of their student, is there something we could help them work on that would help that student at home? And that then becomes part of the behavior plan. Um, we definitely include individualized information on students' specific behavior issues with those suggestions for interactions and recommended interventions. That way everyone's aware of the student's needs and have worked together with the student as a partner on these individualized solutions. So we're also getting feedback from the students on these behavior plans. We try to break down behavior issues into specific and measurable focus behaviors, um, as well as rewards and incentives for the behaviors we'd like to see. So maybe we're looking for them to earn certain percentages of points or not receiving more than a certain number of disciplinary reports. Um, but we really try to stay solution focused on these behavior plans. We're trying to measure youth success and praise that success and help students identify when they're successful. So part of these behavior plans also has to be looking for what the student does well, catching them doing something right. These plans should then outline the specific behavioral reinforcements for not only decreasing the problematic behaviors, but also for using these positive skills and solutions. 
Staff should provide a variety of reinforcements or ones that build on one another, such as moving from verbal praise to token economy incentives. These plans can also be designed as a contract. So it can be a contract set up between the staff and the youth of, on which both sign off on. And then there can be periodic reviews of these plans where everyone talks about the progress and then signs off on that. Uh, we try to do that uh, in, a, in a weekly matter at least so that the use, it stays concrete for the youth, but this would be a way to show on paper what the youth has been doing and have them see something tangible because we think that that helps youth a lot to have something on paper. Um, there are many different types of these behavior plans that we use. We uh, have housing unit ones, education, and ones for temporary separation. Uh, what we've been discussing so far reflects what we do on the housing units, but we also have very specific education behavior plans. Often these are based upon IEPs or feedback from mental health staff after the multidisciplinary team meeting, but this helps teachers work with the students to keep them in class. Um, these plans also indicate when it's appropriate to send the student to the principal whose job is to de-escalate the student and bring them back to class. Really the idea is to give the, the teacher skills or show you know, for example, if a student's using learning a skill in DBT, we can teach the teacher how to recognize that and help the student use that so that they aren't removed from the classroom. Um, and we're, our hope is that we've been giving the students different multiple times to get help to calm down, they can hurry up and get back into class once they're, once they're ready to go so that they're not missing out on their education. And then finally, all students placed in temporary separation are expected and required once they've de-escalated to meet with custody treatment or mental health staff or all three of the above and design a behavior plan before they're released from separation. And this is a very specific plan to help them cope with any of the aggressive behaviors that led them to separation in the first place. They cannot leave separation until these plans are made and the student agrees to try, to try them and all staff are then made aware of them. We then communicate it to those who need to know so they can be watching the student to make sure that he or she is ready to go back in general population or if we need to meet with them again and, and, and help them out some more. Um, any of these types of plans can also be attached to the student information sheets that we talked about earlier as ways of helping out custody staff. Now I'm going to talk about one specialized intensive program we have which is called the MAC program. Um, it is a structured safe therapeutic environment that assists youth in developing appropriate social skills while continuing to participate in education and treatment programs within a controlled setting. We are able to have additional staff in that program. Youth are participating in programs just like other youth in the general population. So they attend education, recreation, leisure, just in a more controlled and structured setting. Youth are placed in the MAC program as a classification decision made by a referral from the treatment staff. And at that classification, we have custody, mental health, education, all of the representatives and departments to refer that youth and review that referral to make sure that we're not placing just any youth in that program. The ultimate goal is to return that youth back to general population housing and programming just as quickly as possible for completion of their treatment program. While in the MAC program, youth can participate in the following programs. Um, we provide aggression replacement therapy, like Mark was speaking about, that provides youth with skills to learn self-control when they are becoming angry. The youth learns to identify triggers, cues, um, ways to reduce anger, reminders, and self-evaluation skills. The goal is the youth identifies pro-social behaviors to replace past aggressive reactions. Another program is the Dialectical Behavior Therapy, DBT, is designed to help students deal with frustration tolerance, stress relief, and impulsivity. This therapy is additional for students who frequently need support dealing with their mental health issues. Another program offered in MAC is the Moral Recognition Therapy, or MRT, it is proven evidence-based and systematic treatment strategy that seeks to decrease recidivism among juveniles by increasing moral reasoning. MRT targets youth who are high risk to reoffend and high risk in criminal thinking. While in the MAC program, the youth issues are addressed through cognitive behavioral groups, individualized behavior plans, that Mark discussed in detail and involvement with mental health staff also. Another program in our facilities is called SHAPE, Specialized Housing Achieving Developmental and Educational Success. 
Shades was developed to meet the therapeutic needs for identified youth. Shades is a specialized treatment program for youth with mental health and emotional disorders. It is not a mental health per se unit. The goal of the program is to maintain students in the least restrictive environment while involving them in treatment programming, using non-punitive incentive-based approaches for managing youth behavior, making a productive transition into the community. The staff working in the Shades unit have a manual that outlines topics regarding staff responsibilities, treatment programming, interventions for staff to utilize with the youth also. And interventions include informal awareness, so discussion of the behavior, um, talking about the token economy, behavior awards, and timelines that are individualized. There's a 411 or information binder for staff, which provides snapshots of the youth, which Mark was talking about as far as the student information sheets. There are issues and behaviors to be aware of, and interventions to utilize the behavior plans if applicable. There's assigned seating in that unit. Um, we have reflection or art stations also, and activity boxes to keep the youth engaged. Another program we have is an honor or incentive program. Um, each facility has a program that recognizes and rewards students that go beyond general performance expectations. Youth are assessed on the behavior, so hygiene, compliance with rules and redirection, um, conduct reports, etc. Also, we evaluate the youth in their treatment involvement, uh, education performance, so the good faith effort. And typically, the program involves a different color shirt so that staff and students recognize that youth that are on that honor status or, or program. The youth receive extra privileges or incentives, such as commissary, off-ground trips. Um, at one of our facilities, which is a female facility, they're allowed to have makeup, too. Another program that we have in our facilities is the Y-TRI unit. Um, Y-TRI is a converted, used to be segregation unit. Um, students earn their way to the unit by meeting behavioral and performance expectations. The unit is less structured by the staff or facility. The students take more responsibility for basic operations and needs of the unit. Uh, the students are allowed to have alarm clocks, so they are responsible for waking themselves up in the morning. There's an established weekly cleaning schedule, and students help develop unit expectations and that schedule. For example, how long you can play the game system. The unit prepares the youth for transition into the community and adulthood. So now, uh, next up is Nick. All right, thank you, Natalie and Mark, for great information and about what Indiana is doing to address uh, challenging populations. So I'm going to go ahead and share uh, what is going on in Oregon. Um, in the similar idea of how how are we doing things in order to address uh, our changing populations. So on this uh, slide, what you're going to see overall is what we call our, our PhD pyramid. And really what we're focusing on at this point in time in, in Oregon is um, the healthy environment. So we've just gone through a process of occupying six new living units that were uh, purposely designed to um, be more healthy in terms of just how they impact both the staff and the youth. So there was a huge emphasis on making sure that they have as much natural light as possible, uh, making sure that the physical plant uh, features were softer uh, but still secure, and also that there, there was um, maximizing living space in there so that youth and staff didn't feel like they were crowded in there and were on top of each other all the time, a crowded environment create cranky people, we know that. So um, that combined with an overall focus for our staff on healthy engagement uh, and our youth. So our goal there is to um, create a culture where youth are bought into uh, getting along with each other, youth to youth, uh, that youth uh, see staff as um, coaches and mentors and guides, um, as resources for help and change. Uh, and those are kind of our two big focuses at this point in time overall in our, our process to develop what we call our, our positive human development culture. Um, and we know that uh, as we continue to build upon that healthy environments and healthy engagement, then we are ultimately supporting healthy brain development, um, which our goal is to um, be part of the overall approach to turning these uh, young men back on track and back out to the community to be successful. I've got slides that have motion to them, so. Uh, so 
we, we heard um, Sharon earlier in her slides talk about uh, the recommendation out of the desk guide for working with youth about creating a culture that's therapeutic. And so our current rendition of that is uh, viewing youth as resource. So we talk a lot about that in our uh, initial staff training and all of our uh, staff updates and the specific talks with staff that happen in terms of how do we get staff to develop their skills is that helping them adopt that resource lens. And so these bullet points are some of the things that we regularly pepper our staff with, and it requires the belief that people can be, our youth can be held accountable and strengthened at the same time. Um, understanding that PhD isn't something that we apply to others, force on others, but it's something that we do with them. Uh, we want staff to be able to capture every interaction with a coworker or with a youth to be an opportunity to um, be more effective than the last time and utilize skills uh, as we go along our work. And so that's uh, every action every time. And we recognize that our environments impact um, how we physically react and then ultimately how our behaviors are uh, affected. So making sure that uh, um, things are clean and tidy, that both staff and youth own their living environments, um, this overall creates for a better experience from day to day. So overall, the resource lens helps us understand that people are a resource to develop and not problems to be fixed. So those are some of our taglines that, um, like I said, are constantly part of our training and acclimation process for our staff here in Oregon. Um, so several years ago in 2015, um, the, we looked at our most challenging population of youth and for us, you know, I'm going to share with you kind of what OYA's story is, but I want to emphasize that, you know, our story in Oregon doesn't have to be everyone's story. And so it's more about a process and less about specific things that Oregon, Oregon did or didn't do. So I don't want um, people listening or other states to get uh, lost or discouraged that this uh, next couple slides don't exactly match their situation, but it's the process that we went through. So we sat down and looked at um, who really are these uh, groups of young people that were causing the, the most problems? So for us, that was measured in, in the amount of incident reports, the amount of youth to youth uh, fights and assaults, um, assaults on staff. And we really kind of dug, dug in and, and looked at them from a variety of different ways. We used that multidisciplinary approach to try to understand them as best as, as we could. Um, and ultimately, we, we recognized on the front end that we probably needed to create a different environment for them, but we didn't really know what that environment was going to look like um, on the front end. Now that we're a couple years into it, we understand better now uh, what that environment needs to be, and we're uh, kind of in that process to continually make changes to that uh, um, specific program. So that became to be known as the University of Life, um, and that is our unit, just like Indiana kind of talked about, two specialized um, um, programs and units they have to help these young people. This is our version of that. It's called the University of Life. And it was kind of our first crack at really um, doing a uh, intensive retreat experiment or experience for the staff and doing some um, education around mental health needs for youth, trauma-informed care. Uh, we went through some of those role play scenarios that in Indiana talked about how do we approach a youth that's you know displaying this kind of behavior all for the purpose of creating uh, a living unit that uh, was based in PhD um, and that would uh, address our specific needs for these types of youth. Um, and our goal really for these youth, we were trying to prevent two primary things that ultimately these types of youth in our system um, would find themselves in in terms of their situation. So um, a, a lot of our youth, or not a lot of our youth, but our youth in, in our system um, you know, through peer-to-peer -peer assaults or staff assaults can wind up with adult charges, which then they still might stay within our system. Um, and if they don't change that behavior, they can transfer on once they reach um, uh, age 18, they can, you know, penetrate clear into the adult system. So we recognize that when that happens, that we have to own that as a failed process on our end. So we wanted to just shut that off for sure. And then we also recognize that even when some of these young people did stabilize it was really difficult to get them to be able to transition uh, successfully back to the community. So those are kind of our two, two primary objectives. And that's why I'm saying um, that's what our goal was in Oregon when we went through this process. So if that doesn't sound like 
um, a particular need that you have, um, hang in there with me. It's about the process and not necessarily the specific outcomes. But we knew that we had to create a, a unit and identify these kids early on so that we could um, not go down this track at all in terms of um, developing more and more entrenched, uh, aggressive, assaultive behavior towards uh, peers and staff. That was our, our goal number one. <clears throat> Move on to the next slide here. Um, so we have the tale of two youth. And so when we looked at that population, we looked at the kids that were struggling the most, um, two kind of primary deductions that we reached. So you had one group of kids that did have the um, significant complex trauma history. These were young people that probably had at a home placements at a very young age and maybe had several foster care placements over time, transitioning to residential care placements, and then ultimately coming to um, state custody, and primarily through um, some sort of person-to-person -person crime, but it, it typically was against their own family or maybe a staff in one of those residential programs. So a lot of these kids have been in the system since they were really young and little, and then progressively they have uh, escalated in terms of their aggression to the point to where they come with us. Um, and so that was one group. And so we knew that um, really their emotions and their is what was presenting the, the biggest hurdle for them, that once they become emotionally triggered, um, their behavior escalates and is really difficult to manage. So that was one group. Um, the, the other group, when they looked at it, tended to be more of our intentional uh, aggressive kids meeting. There was more pre-plan, there was more thought um, given to it. Um, there was more coordination, more uh, manipulation in order to set up a scenario where they could uh, assault a peer uh, in that situation. And so uh, we, internally, we kind of called those kids our willfully aggressive kids. Um, also recognizing that, yes, those kids, if they had better skills and different skills, could make different choices. So we're not saying that they um, you know, aren't open uh, to be helped from skill development at all, but just a different type of presentation uh, in terms of how they were um, kind of what was driving their aggressive behavior. So that's how we split the, the two young men. And I'll also say that in our kind of initial interview process, and we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a, in a few slides, but um, the earlier group, the emotional reactivity kids, um, after an incident, they would be quick to show remorse and you know, staff perceived that as genuine remorse. And they would say things like, I don't know why I did that. I don't know, you know why I overreacted. Or they would say, I don't remember what happened. I'm sorry that so-and-so got hurt. Versus the other group uh, would take more kind of a hard line with that. And they were less likely to show remorse, less um, uh, empathy for people that got hurt and involved. So that was another kind of the distinguisher between the two groups. <clears throat> Um, so the new program and a new protocol. So again, this is going to describe um, the two different ways that we uh, developed to work with those two groups that I described of youth. And so the new program is the University of Life, um, and it's you know was established on a um, developmental basis where staff were focused on understanding the developmental needs uh, of those youth at all times. Um, and just constantly receiving training, coaching, and feedback around uh, that approach. Uh, for the other set of kids, uh, we developed what was called uh, the Community Safety Protocol, and that is designed to uh, provide some relief to the unit if there's an egregious assault. It's not easy to get on the Community Safety Protocol. In the last um, year and a half that it's been active, we've only had one young person on it. Um, despite you know you know fights and assaults that have occurred, so it's not easy to get on it, um, but it's designed to give you know a break to that unit, um, let some folks really kind of dig into that youth um, situation in case, and then figure out um, if there's a solution so that we, we can uh, turn them back to the unit with a a good plan in place. So that's kind of the two different approaches. So the emotional reactive kids, we created a unit for them. Uh, for the more willfully aggressive, we do have an option to uh, provide some space. Uh, around significant events when they occur. Um, the new program, um, like I've already mentioned a couple different times, is really uh, focused on understanding the impact of complex trauma, which 
you know, in real time means that each of these kids arrive to the unit with uh, different stories to tell. So part of that process of them being on the unit is getting them um, comfortable enough so that they can kind of share their story so that staff can understand how that they can um, change their approach in order to help them uh, maintain uh, emotion regulation throughout you know, their shift and through their day. And that's you know, easier said than done. Uh, for some kids, there's, it takes a long time for them to build the capacity to trust the staff. But each of those kids come with um, significant trauma histories. And part of that process of being effective with them is understanding how that uh, trauma really kind of plays out in the here and now in their everyday functioning. Also recognizing that traditional responses to problem behavior, traditional correctional style um, is ultimately what, what these kids in our system on the facility side end up reacting to and uh, escalates their behavior more than anything. And so trying to get smarter about that and learning different ways to um, redirect problematic behavior is a huge part of this program. The large emphasis on skill building and, and emotion regulation, self-regulation, and getting the staff uh, really bought into the skill building process has been huge so that they can understand the skills that the kids are learning in, in their uh, individual sessions with our mental health folks and also in their group sessions so that the staff can coach them in the moment, can model it for them, can prompt them. And that's a huge part of the success that happens on, on this unit uh, when the staff are bought into the skill building process. And we're also constantly educating both staff and youth um, through the curriculum that we'll talk about here in a second, um, just how the brain works and how to work your brain. And it's that idea that we, we're borrowing from Dan Siegel that if you can name um, what's going on in your brain, then that's the first step into being able to tame it. So you got to be able to name it to tame it uh, is a concept that we're working on um, taking root there in that unit. <clears throat> and I, I'll, one more thing before I move on is that I mentioned earlier that we had a retreat experiment experience where we took the staff away for, for two weeks and just really kind of bombarded them with, with great information, in my opinion. Uh, but it's a lot, and it was fairly overwhelming for the staff. Uh, but I'll tell you, in the last um, two years, what's been more impactful for them is being able to kind of see these things in front of their own eyes uh, during the work that they do. And so um, being able to kind of uncover what's really driving problematic behavior, like we know on the surface, we know in theory, we know. but there's been several examples where staff have kind of had the aha moment and realized that, hey, maybe this behavior isn't because this kid is trying to be obstinate right now, maybe there's something else driving it. And it's been those stories that have been most impactful for the rest of the team to really kind of have that information about trauma-informed care really sink in. So. And it's that concept of you don't know what you don't know, but when you see it, uh, you can recognize that there it is. <clears throat> so this is an infographic that kind of describes the um, Nexus curriculum, that's what we called it. And so um, overall, it's about a nine month skill building uh, protocol and we developed it in-house and in the center there, you kind of have the, um, the four major life need areas. Uh, they believe, excel, balance, and contribute, and that's that idea that um, once kids get these areas um, spinning in the right direction, that um, things are moving uh, along quite well, and, and uh, they all kind of converge on the center, which is the nexus. So uh, believe, and this is kind of what I would posit that all people in, in, in this world, um, they have a need in this area, right? And so. Uh, believe is that concept is that you have to have a positive vision for yourself and for your future. And without that, um, most intervention won't, won't stick. And so uh, help, ha having the staff kind of recognize that and helping them constantly remind um, the youth that, that they can improve, they can get better, they can graduate from high school, uh, they can go to college, uh, all these things. And then also doing it from the, the youth point of view, you know, making sure that they're vested in their own program uh, is, is a huge part of that belief uh, process. Balance is that holistic health idea, stress management. Um, this is where our coping skills are. This is where uh, we educate them about, you know, the necessity for correct diet, um, taking medications as prescribed, uh, making sure that they get exercise. So there's, a, there's an exercise and wellness component to that. Um, and all of that really is for the purpose of 
um, stress management and when we have low stress levels in our life because we're using our skills and we're taking care of ourselves mentally, physically, and spiritually, then the problems that come our way are much more manageable and they don't seem as, as big. Um, but if we're you know, in an unbalanced state, uh, it doesn't take much of a problem to throw this further out of um, um, our ability to be effective in this moment. So, so balance is a big part of that. Uh, contribute is our idea that um, no matter where you're at, <clears throat> whether you like it or not, you are part of a community. And if you're going to be a part of a community, um, you own a, a piece of making that community better. So that's where uh, we encourage uh, youth to help one another out, to be encouraging, to use supportive language at all times, um, to be there for one another, and you know, a constant reminder, how, how can you contribute to your community in a positive way today is a huge part of this. Um, and then Excel is the, is the application part. And so um, you can do well in the other three areas. You can learn a lot in the other three areas, but if you don't apply them and try to um, stretch yourself, uh, be bought into personal development, set goals for yourself, learn how to deal with setbacks, um, then we're just kind of spinning our wheels. So Excel is that personal application for each youth. Um, it's their own goal setting that they review on a daily and weekly basis. That's part of their um, you know, ongoing case review. It's, the, it's where they can demonstrate, this is where I was at, this is the skills that I've learned, this is where I've progressed to. And so Excel is all about that goal achievement, goal setting process. And so in a nutshell, underneath all of those four areas there are specific um, sessions that are led um, by our, our um, group facilitator and that's split up in this unit. This unit has about um, 14 kids in it. They split them up into two separate groups and, and run sessions twice a week is the current format around that. So that's Nexus in, in a nutshell there. I'm going to skip through this because I think I described it all from the uh, uh, infographic, but um, Nexus you know, is in-house design, but there was four or five of us with um, at least 10 years experience uh, in this field. And so we were all borrowing upon what we felt worked the best to kind of come up with a an amalgamation of a curriculum. So um, some of it will look um, a lot like CBT and DBT, and that's on purpose because there's some great uh, approaches and skills that are in there. And at the same time, uh, we worked hard to make it our own and to really kind of match the needs of, of these kids here in Oregon. So we are also in a process of um, a follow-up, creating a shorter experience for our staff um, and then letting them kind of uh, decompress the last year and a half since the program has really been officially open. Um, and so that's kind of in the works. Uh, we've got some other logistical things here that's been going on in Oregon, consolidating uh, facilities that has kind of pushed us back. This was scheduled to happen in August, but that, this will happen probably uh, end of the fall. So. Uh, we'll have more information to report out in terms of how this um, program is developing. But, you know, ultimately, uh, what I can say is um, we've had some success with some very difficult kids, meaning that we've transitioned some of these young men back out to the community when um, there wasn't a whole lot of hope for them on the front end. And so that's been very exciting in terms of the specific outcomes that we're looking for um, for developing the youth. This, this slide here that we're on talks about you know, the, the concepts that were discussed during the staff retreat. Um, again, I won't necessarily spend a ton of time here delving through all of them, um, but basically we set the stage for the staff, said you know, this is where we're at and this is where we need to be and how do we get there. And so we spent that uh, two full weeks help, uh, empowering them to um, create this program within the parameters around that needed to be representative of our positive human development culture uh, it needed to be different than traditional corrections, and it needed to be uh, focused on skill building and leveraging what we know about trauma-informed care. So setting up those parameters, we really just facilitated ongoing discussions with the staff till we got to the point at the end that we could say that we have something to, to go with, and that was our uh, retreat experience. A big part of it for them, too, was also uh, bonding as staff as well, which was a huge part of it. 
So the referral process to the U, um, we try to make this referral straight out of our intake units. And so um, we try to identify youth within the first 30 days that probably would, would be candidates for the U. Uh, once that referral is made, our treatment services supervisors take a look at that case. Uh, when we look at it, we're looking for evidence of complex trauma and then trauma that is uh, currently being you know, observed and problematic symptoms. And so we'll look at incident reports and see to what extent this might have been a trauma trigger related type of response. Um, so if those things are in place, um, then we'll have the staff from the University of Life go visit the young person on intake, kind of get a feel for them, and then we'll make a plan to transition them to, to the unit. So uh, we're trying to identify these young people straight out of intake um, so that we avoid the process of uh, a failed placement otherwise, uh, and that just makes it harder overall to transition youth back out to the community. And so far, that's been working pretty well. Uh, it's fairly easy for us to monitor the kids that we say yes to versus the ones that say no to, and it's been a pretty good selection process thus far. Pretty happy with that. Talked about this um, admission criteria. It's you know for me personally, it's not so much dependent on a specific diagnosis because um, everybody can respond to a trauma history differently. But I am looking for those, you know, early childhood experiences where um, there's exposure to violence, there's neglect, and then you have to couple that with problematic behavior in the here and now. So that's really what I'm looking for around that. Uh, um, other indicators are the, are the failed placements um, that have occurred over the young person's trajectory through the system. And you know, overall, we're labeling these young people emotionally reactive. So. Um, at this point, they lack, lack the skills to understand um, their specific experience, feelings, and emotions, and then how to regulate them when they uh, become problematic. That's, that's a big part of um, the criteria for admitting them. To support the, the U, we have a, an ongoing team that stays closely connected to the to the staff there, and we get feedback from them on a, right now it's a by every other week basis, and then providing consultation and direction for how to make program changes, slight ones here and there, how do we uh, activate other resources in the state to help either with transition or just provide training, that's all part of our support process um, as this unit has gone up and, and, and going online. <clears throat> This is going to switch over to what we're doing with the community safety protocol. And so this is the other group of kids that were problematic in our situation. Um, you know, really the takeaway here is that we want all of our living units to own our kids. So we don't have a place or a system anymore where, where living units can refer um, a young person to uh, for permanent placement or permanent reassignment. So we are in that process of equipping all of our facilities and all of our units to once a young person is assigned there, that that's going to be where they remain until they transition back to the community. And again, we're having pretty good success with that, especially given our system three or four or five years ago where uh, facilities could refer kids on an ongoing basis. And uh, I was one of the gatekeepers for that. And I was, you know, reviewing four or five kids a week. And um, I can say in the last two years, maybe um, two or three kids that have been referred for uh, facility reassignment. Um, so that's really the big part of it. So even if a young person goes on um, the community safety protocol, uh, that unit that referred them to that is still owning that, that, that young person and staying involved with their programming and, and, and skill building. Um, so CSP is for, you know, egregious uh, behavior or a pattern of assaultive behavior. And again, it's just there to uh, provide some space for the living unit so that we can figure out what are some of the triggers and drivers for this, um, create up a, a better plan for support and safety, um, get the young person back on track with um, their, their overall case plan goals and objectives, find out what the barriers are, and then once we have that plan back in place, we can, we can transition them back to the living unit uh, with a better, better understanding of how to support this young person. So overall, the goals are keeping your community safe, um, making sure if it's a peer or staff issue that we do some conflict resolution, 
Um, if it's an ongoing, perhaps gang impacted issue, um, working you know with the other parts of the facility and campus, for how can we manage this and help uh, people on both sides of this tolerate one another, um, helping the young person you know see other ways to solve problems other than fighting and becoming aggressive, and all of that with the goal of returning to the or living it as soon as possible with a safe plan in place. Uh, these are just some of the, uh, the menu of things that are available. It's not like we're marching through all of these things, but we look at the incident or the pattern of incidents that uh, resulted in the referral for the community safety protocol, and then we match these um, requirements and uh, skill approaches up to the specific incident into the youth. So again, I'm not saying that we march through all of these for every single time. This is just, uh, part of the menu that's available for folks. And that's what I have um, from Oregon. Hopefully that was um, fast but quick information for you. And I'm going to pass this on over to Peter and to, to present the next group of slides. So um, my name is Peter Forbes. I'm the DYS commissioner in Massachusetts. And I'm going to share with you a couple of things that we've been working on on, on this front. Um, I'm impressed with my colleagues from Indiana and Oregon. And I think that what I take away from the first two uh, presenters is that this is complex and it, it requires, um, you know, kind of a sustained effort. Um, so thank you, Natalie, Mark, and Nick. Um, try to advance the slide. Okay. Um, so in Massachusetts, we, we've been at this for, for a, a number of years. Uh, we really have had it. We've tried, uh, we've worked toward um, flipping our behavioral management system to a behavioral support system where there's balance between um, incentives and sanctions. And we, we're using the term response rather than sanction uh, and really trying to figure out how to engage youth. One of the primary um, goals for us in, in working with um, all youth really is try to figure out what, they, what, what they're interested in um, and, and using that as a way of kind of leveraging the treatment process of opening that door up. Um, so it's not just trying to catch them when they're doing things wrong, but rewarding them for um, positive behavior accomplishments and trying to figure out uh, individually how, how, to, how to engage their interest. Um, we've done, I mean, every, everybody nationally, I think understands that the cognitive behavioral approach is the way to go. You know, we've gone um, with DBT, it's worked for us. We've been doing it for 12 years. We have an outside independent evaluation that from Smith College that says that um, essentially you've built skilled through that process. Um, one of the things that we did in that process, uh, probably about three or four years in, was we we pulled it out of the, out of the strictly out of the, the clinical realm and had our direct care staff. Uh, co-facilitate groups and that's what's going on today the model in mass is if you go in all of our programs do two DBT groups a week and the groups have co-facilitated between a licensed clinical person and um, a direct care staff person and we've had a lot of success with that that doesn't solve all of all of the challenges but it's a good platform and a good base to build off of uh, for young people that are struggling um, and that are not getting traction in the program or acting out. Uh, we've gone to, a, we actually have a policy and a process called the individual support plan that essentially is um, a triage plan that includes the parent and the, and, the, and the young person with the professionals in the program to really get around, you know, how do we get this young person on track so that they're back in the program doing what they need to do and moving forward. Uh, and it's very individualized and we work on, you know, first and foremost, trying to get the young person and their parent bought into it. Um, so one of the things that we did uh, probably about 
seven or eight years ago is we opened up a program we call it the stabilization unit it's in western massachusetts it's a secure program it's a locked program it's not a punishment unit um, it's, it's a program that um, we where we place young people who act out violently in our secure program so if somebody really hurts some uh, generally hurts a staff person but it could be hurting another, another another youth in the program we have the option of referring them into the stabilization unit and the stabilization unit um, essentially takes you know whoever is is presented they take them on an individualized basis and the idea is to try to reassess the plan as to whether or not that young person goes back to the program that they were assigned to or whether or not they need to be considered for reassignment to another program what kind of behavioral strategies work um, in that particular program we don't run any uh, groups um, they don't sit and do um, group work in school it's all totally individualized it's well resourced and well staffed uh, we've had a lot of a lot of success over the past probably two or three years the program itself is, is very stable and one of the things that has really been helpful is that if you have a, a, a staff member who gets injured in an incident or in an assault the ability to remove the young person and I don't think you should do that all the time but the ability in certain situations to remove the young person really um, it diffuses the situation allows that staff person to get back to work feeling safe and a lot of times um, it short circuits the process where some staff feel as though they need to go outside to the police and the courts to file charges against kids so we've had a fair amount of success with that program um, a lot of these young people are traumatized um, one of the presenters earlier talked about you know there are certain kids that if you touch them on the shoulder you could trigger you know behavior that you would never have expected a lot of the kids, the young people that go to the stabilization unit have trauma histories, and it gives us a, a safe place to work with them, get them refocused, um, and try to figure out where, where to go with that. Uh, the other thing that we've done um, really kind of on the flip side of the incentive is develop a system of repairs for the accountability process so that there is a response to the behavior. It doesn't always have to be you know kind of cookie cutter punitive sit in the chair for three hour kind of response but we've, we've moved away from that um, to a more thoughtful accountability process it's complex it doesn't necessarily look the same in all of our programs we've allowed some autonomy at the program level and we're struggling a little bit with how to make sure that we have some quality control there but the idea is that the response is commensurate with the behavior and that there's some thought about what might register with this young person and it doesn't make any sense to give a writing assignment to a young person who, who can't write well um, so there are a lot there's a wide range and one of the things that we've instituted in some of our programs is that the young person actually depending upon the um, infraction they have input into what their repair is um, so it's not like it's a, a, a four-hour repair it's it's a it's an activity or a defined um, process that they have to complete and then they're considered to you know kind of return to, to the group and um, we've gotten much more formally into debriefing uh, what went on and um, you know what would be a safe plan for a young person so that the response of, of you know seven or eight years ago which is put him in his room is just not um, that's not where we're going we're, we're going to be a lot more thoughtful about it there are a lot of things that you can do short of putting a young person in their room and we still do we still do use room confinement for, for young people that are being uh, violent or acting out um, safety committee you know we, we we organized the safety committee um, we've been doing this for years but probably for the last three years we've been very formal um, it's chartered to improve safety in the programs. It's chaired by, we have two deputy commissioners. It's co-chaired by the two deputy commissioners. It includes um, labor representatives, uh, our workforce is organized. Um, and we've got HR folks, policy folks, um, our data folks, our lead managers from the field. We put a lot of energy into our safety committee. 
It's every, they meet every six weeks and they're constantly looking at the data trends, you know, where's the activity, what's going on, and then how do we get in and, and do some root cause analysis on um, what the strategy, strategies would be to, you know, try to um, turn, turn things around and, and improve the outcomes. We um, have instituted a process recently, it's really more of a pilot, where we, we um, did a debrief on 57 incidents that involved assault in a period of four months, and most of them were fights, kid on, youth on youth assault, um, and then some of them were youth on staff assault, and we have interviewed, surveyed in writing electronically the program director, clinical director, and the youth involved. And um, some of the high-level findings are that to the extent that the program director, clinical director, and youth involved all understand the incident the same way, it's much easier to move forward. Um, and good programs have good communication, and, they, and, and in good programs, um, staff have solid relationships with the kids. I mean, everybody on the call knows that. But if you can deliver a quality program, then you don't have a lot of that risk behavior. Um, cooking at all times. Um, one of the other things that, that, that we've done is essentially um, recognizing that um, in some situations staff do get hurt and that there has to be um, a formalized process to provide support and to try to um, make sure that, that staff are feeling safe in their work environment and that they're confident that they can do their job. So we've initiated um, a, a support services, I won't say a unit, but it's really one, one person with a, um, a backup. And um, we have a protocol that's written that talks about exactly what we do in the event of a, of a staff being assaulted. Um, you know, very similar to what a lot of you folks probably do is offer the EAP but we have senior representatives um, from our manage, uh, local management teams reach out. Um, and it's all individualized. If the staff member wants to do mediation or that they would be satisfied or interested in an apology, um, there's, there's an opportunity to review the young person's um, assignment in their case to see if there may be um, a reassignment in order um, or some kind of time extension. Um, so we do a really formal process and part of what we've done in Massachusetts is we, our position is that in the event that a staff is assaulted and they want to press charges, we'll support them up to and including having a, ma a local manager go to court with them when they have to go in for the um, probable cause hearing. So we go, we accompany the staff member um, for critical court appearances. Um, but we also offer an alternative, which is more of a mediation and um, support and, um, you know, some correct, corrective um, activity around, around the young person. And it's really helped us um, have a lot more credibility with the workforce that if, if bad things happen, that, that, you know, first of all, it's unacceptable. And second of all, we're going to step in and um, we're gonna formally support you and, and, and make sure that you get the help that you need so you feel safe in your employment. So those are um, four or five things that, that we're doing in Massachusetts. I think it's very consistent with what you heard from Indiana and Oregon. And I'm gonna hand this back to Mike Dempsey. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, great presentation by everyone. and. I want to just quickly before we move into the the questions, I want to reiterate the uh, think the points that Peter was touching on about the staff safety issues. Um, it is incredibly important that as you move through the process of reducing the use of isolation and looking at alternative approaches to how you respond to the behaviors of the kids we have in our facilities, it is incredibly important that you really spend a lot of time focusing on staff safety. I've said this before and I'll say it again, that staff truly believe that using isolation is what keeps them safe. And we have taught them that historically over the, over the years and we've trained them to respond to assaultive behaviors in a way 
through the means of locking kids up in, in a room. And we know through the data that that does not make them any safer. In fact, it makes things um, more unsafe, but it is truly what they believe. So it is incredibly important that you as leaders and managers of moving through the process of these changes that you spend a lot of time educating your staff, retraining your staff, but also um, uh, helping to uh, share the data and the information so that they truly believe that these changes are going to, to result in, in better safety and they're not going to be, their safety will not be jeopardized as a result of this process. So I want to thank, uh, quickly want to thank Natalie and Mark and Nick and Peter again for taking the time to um, put all the work together to prepare for these presentations. They take an incredibly amount of a lot, lot of time and energy. And in addition, you know, they, they, they have other jobs as well. So taking the time to, to just to prepare and to present today is incredibly helpful and important. And everybody here on the call and at CJCA really appreciates their time and dedication for that. So with that, I'm gonna, uh, Brendan has a couple of questions that I think he's going to throw out to the presenters. Yeah, and we've got some questions. We've been taking them throughout the course of the presentation, so I've got some in here. And if you want to ask a question, you can do so by typing it in on the webinar control panel. It's towards the bottom of that panel on the right-hand side of your screen. You can type in your questions. Uh, just make sure when you do so, if you could help me out and just uh, try to point me in the right direction. If you don't know the presenter's name, if you know what state they were from, I can make sure I direct the question to the right person here. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by going all the way back to Natalie and Mark, since you guys went first and you haven't spoken for a little bit. I'll bring it back to you guys. Uh, um, I think, Mark, you had actually presented over the multidisciplinary meetings. Correct. And you had a list of all the people that were involved. And so I've got a good question here from, from Natalie, uh, not the Natalie next to you, but another Natalie. Right. Uh, <laughs> we want to know how complicated is it to get all the different parties together? So are these staff... I mean, you get staff that work different shifts, they work different days of the week. Uh, is it during their regular staff hours? You mentioned getting families involved. So how complicated is that process of getting those uh, meetings together? It depends on the facility, but we tend to, we tend to schedule them, each facility schedules them at a, uh, can be right after lunch on a Monday or Friday or Wednesday. What we try to do is get, uh, for custody staff, we get the custody supervisors um, who are usually there working Monday through Friday. And then we also get the uh, either the officer in charge or the, the, the custody staff member who is on for that shift. So we do alternate. We actually like a variety of custody staff coming in. So we, we have the, the admin custody staff always there every week, but then we have rotating members of shifts coming in. Um, if there's an evening staff person who's who we think could benefit from coming in, they just make adjustments in their schedule to allow them to come in. Um, we treatment staff, it's easy to bring in. Education staff, they have some time after while the students are at lunch and are doing their hygiene and preparing for afternoon classes. The teachers are all given that that hour um, to have that meeting. So. We tend to also, after the, if there's time after the multidisciplinary meeting, they can have an education meeting. So they sort of schedule their meeting at that time too afterwards. So we found that that's been relatively um, easy to do. When with families, if we can't have the family present during that particular meeting, then we'll arrange it uh, via either phone or, or uh, not FaceTime, but something like that. Some we have a system like that where the family can call in and we have the mental health people there. So families, it's a little more difficult, but um, we also will call the families if, after incidents. So we try to get the family involved immediately following an incident as well. So, but for the multidisciplinary meeting, it's more when we've, we've had some chronic issues with the youth then we'll try to arrange for that family member to call in during that time. Don't know if that answers everything. Uh, hopefully we covered all the bases there, so appreciate that. And um, I've actually got a good amount of questions coming your way, but I'm I'm going to do my best to bounce around here. And and so Nick, I'll have you come up next. But uh, before I do that, I've got a lot of questions about more information on some of the individual programs that you guys talked about here today. Maybe some of the forms or training examples. 
And uh, before I put any one of our panelists kind of on the spot here, we'll make sure we have permission from the states that presented today uh, before we hand out anything in regards to additional information, but anything that we can get. I've got about four or five different questions that are all pretty similar about getting some more information. So we'll follow up with all of those after today's webinar and anything that we could share, we will absolutely do so. So thank you all for those questions. And um, coming up to Nick, so uh, somebody had asked about the community safety protocol, the CSP that you had mentioned earlier. And uh, so the question is, is any form of isolation, so any involuntary placement in their cell or their room alone, is that utilized on the community safety protocol? And uh, so I'm not quite sure how well that fits the, the program that you were talking about, but uh, maybe kind of paint that picture of, of how isolation practices are used when people are on that CSB. Uh, thanks, that's a, that's a great question. And so uh, with isolation is used you know, in response to either uh, imminent possibility of aggression or aggression has occurred. So I would say that yes, a, a young person that has been referred to CSP has initially been through a, a stint of isolation in response to um, some sort of a, aggressive a, a assaultive behavior. So uh, isolation can be part of CSP. It doesn't have to be, uh, but even when it is, it's for uh, a, a short amount of time, uh, meaning that we will assign resource staff to that young person to bring them out of their, their room and kind of create uh, their own living space. And then during that time, uh, when they're away from the unit, that's when we're uh, bringing their unit staff, we're bringing peer mentors down, and we're having um, discussions, engagement conversations, and really kind of understand uh, if there's some other things that are driving this behavior um, that we can problem solve around. And so, uh, the short answer is yes, there are there is isolation that can be used while a young person's on CSP, uh, but it isn't the primary or only intervention. And when a young person goes on CSP, uh, they are assigned resource staff to uh, limit the amount of um, um, time spent behind, in a room behind a locked door. So hopefully that, that answers the question. Uh, CSP follows the young person wherever they're at. So even if they're off the unit, um, you know, in, in our isolation area, but CSP also follows them as they transfer back to the living unit um, to make sure that the plans that were developed are um, being uh, pushed through and, and implemented. Great. Well, thank you, Nick, for the answer, and thank you, Karen, for the question. Hopefully, we're, we're able to answer that. And I'm going to go back to Indiana and uh, ask a question because I got a couple questions about the the, the MAC unit and. Um, some of the things that you had had on the slides earlier. And on one of the slides around the uh, the MAC program, you had said, okay, we're doing ART, we're doing DBT, we're doing MRT. Uh, so we got a question from Josh, who had a few good questions today, but uh, one of the things he asked is, how are you doing all these things on that, that one unit? And um, you know, how is that kind of applied without really overwhelming and, and staff being overwhelmed, the kids being overwhelmed? Now, how do you figure out which skills the youth are supposed to be using uh, so maybe talk about if you got all these, these different, that whole acronym soup that's in there um, yeah. on this unit. How is that applied across? So what we do is we we take a look at those three programs are addressing different issues for different students. They don't, not every student gets all three. So when a student is placed in the MAC program, they uh, do an individual treatment plan with them to figure out which combination of those groups would work out best. The way that I tend to look at it, um, and, and I know, and we bring this up at the other facilities too with those three programs, um, ART is going to be more of your classic um, anger management program, students who intermittent explosive disorder, um, more, all, but also students who use their aggression in sort of a manipulative way. So we're going to take a look at at running, and and you have to understand when it's they're open, they're all run as open-ended groups. So when students are brought into MAC, uh, they attend the the sections of that group that apply to them. With DBT, we're looking at more uh, mental health students who have uh, distress tolerance, students who have a hard, hard time getting along just in general with other people, students who are anxious, students who uh, have a trauma background. So the DBT, now that's facilitated. We bring our mental health staff in to do that group. So ART is going to be run by the counselors, the correctional counselors who are present um, on that 
uh, in around the MAC program in that living unit. And the DBT is going to be brought in and run at a different time by mental health staff. And then MRT is an ongoing program that are, is run by specially trained staff that are brought into that unit. Um, and MRT is more for students who have chronic uh, embracing of a criminal lifestyle who rather than they're probably down been referred to the MAC program because of open defiance or they've they they use their size and their and their uh, abilities to manipulate other kids others you know they try to um, be aggressive towards staff so MRT we're going to use and MRT is running two days a week with another day on the weekend um, for help preparing for presentations so MRT is more of an ongoing the way that it's set up there's there's 12 regular classes, but they're all open-ended. So students kind of come in, all the kids are on. I don't want to go too much into MRT, but they're all on different steps at the same time. So that program is very easy to run on a unit with kids constantly coming in because each kid starts at step one, but the whole classroom isn't on step one. So, so I think we, we struggle the most probably with the ART since the ART does, t the lessons do tend to build on one another. Um, the students, tend to go to that one more regularly right when they come in they're 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 brought in as a cohort but the other two are very open and it's so it's easy to kind of a, a match students to what they need but it's been provided by different staff so it's not just the staff on in mac who are doing the groups we bring in other staff that definitely helps clarify all that so thank you mark and mm -hmm. since we mentioned dbt quickly i'll go to peter for just a minute uh, i think there's a quick question here but uh, when I see this, I, I see somebody that's interested in maybe doing a training, but the question was, uh, who did you use for uh, teaching the DBT to the direct care staff? Because I think you had mentioned DBT as well. Yeah, so uh, we, I, I, we have a psychologist who's our clinical director, Yvonne Sparling, and um, she worked very closely with the, I want to say it's a woman who really created the DBT module uh, I was originally created for um, adult incarcerated women. So uh, is it Lenahan? I'm not sure if that's the right name, but Marsha Lenahan? I'm not sure, but we got it from the source. We had a champion in-house, which is a PhD level psychologist. And the other thing that we did, uh, we've done and we're doing now, is we, um, we have DBT coaches on contract that are clinic clinicians that are mobile. So they'll go into the programs that need a boost on DBT. So it kind of came top down through the clinical group of the agency, and then we provided a resource on the ground for the programs to be able to implement it. But our clinical staff really embraced the DBT. I hope that answered the question. I hope so too. Thanks, Peter. And um, I've got 228 is what I'm showing on the time here, and I've got uh, one question that I want to make sure I get answered because uh, Colette had asked it twice, and I think, Mark, this might have been uh, earlier while you were presenting, as you mentioned something about uh, solution-focused uh, process, mm -hmm. and the question is what theoretical construct is used in the solution-focused process? So what it, it's going to depend on the clinical director at each facility. Um, so for example, you know, I'm, I'm how actually housed at the Camp Summit facility. And so what we're looking at there is we try to openly discuss what the student's issues are. And I mean, you have to also understand you have non-clinicians at this meeting. So you have education, staff, custody, and even some of our correctional counselors. And they're gonna state the issues in their terms. So for example, I can do a specific example from last week. Um, I have a student who's defined in my class. And so our clinical director, when I, when I talk about solution focused, we're gonna try to figure out what's really going on behind that behavior. So does this seem to be a student who isn't controlling their behavior or is this a student who's manipulating a behavior? And depending on that answer, that's going to, the mental health staff are gonna guide um, that this was a teacher who brought it up, guide that teacher to different skills they could use. If it becomes a chronic issue, and so we try to do sort of, um, he uses 
a lot of our clinical directors will use certain DBT skills that they then train the staff in and have the staff go try that with the youth. If it's becoming a more chronic issue or if it's more open manipulation of staff or defiance of staff, then we start talking about referral processes to something like MRT. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if we necessarily have a, a specific approach that we use with solution focus. It's more just rather than saying the student's a problem in my class, we may we we walk the, the person through exactly what are the behaviors. And then we try to tie that to what may be going on with the youth before we offer solutions. So that's more of what I meant by solution focused. Well, Ben, I think that helps clarify. So thanks again, Mark, and and thank you to our panelists. And what I'll do is turn it right back over to my right here and Mike, take us home. Yeah, just uh, real quickly, I want to thank all the participants for uh, calling in on the webinar today. And I want to thank Sharon and uh, Brendan both for helping to coordinate and again, thank the panelists for the time that they took to provide you with all this uh, tremendous, valuable information. Um, for the, for the, we also have through CJCA, we have affiliate memberships that are available that you can take a look at on our CJCA uh, website. If you're interested in accessing more CJCA resources and upcoming webinars, you can take a look at that, and they, those can be accessible to everyone through the an affiliate membership. Thank you all very much. Uh, Sharon, did you have anything to close out with? Nope, I think that's it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.